Let's start off with a little bit of prayer. Father in heaven, I just pray you'd guide this time that we're together uh, with you and with one another. Uh, and you'd give me the right words to say this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I haven't really worked on a sermon this week. Uh, I had kind of gathered some thoughts and some comments, bits and pieces here, here and there. I hadn't really planned it to be a sermon. And then, you know, this morning it kind of was knitting together a little more than that as I was reviewing my notes. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, but before I get started on that, uh, I want to uh, invite you to offer whatever kind of feedback you have on what we're doing. Uh, if there are topics uh, that you think would be helpful, questions you think would be good to address, any suggestions, uh, really interested in that. I'll put my contact information up here on the screen. And I, I'm gonna continue on the, the sort of Lent theme and kind of bounce around that a little bit. But I wanna begin by just sharing some things that have been uh, a blessing to me in the last few weeks. Uh, the first of those I wanna mention is just the care and concern that people have shown uh, from the church uh, after my mother passed away and during the time following where I'm uh, expending a lot of uh, my time figuring out how to support my father through this time and into whatever's next for him. So thanks for all the words and the demonstrations of your love. Uh, that's been really, really helpful. Um, I was uh, thinking about all this uh, not just a day or two after my mom passed away, and I, I came across a statement that someone uh, made about families and life, and I'll just, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. Uh, people come into our lives and they go out. Families change. It can be hard and sad, but we bear it as long as we don't shut ourselves off from the new wonderful things that come. It will be all right. Uh, and then, and then the, there's a, a comment about, about loving one another and how much uh, families love one another. And the, the comment ends with, don't waste that. Take what we've had and build on it. In that way, we'll still be together. That's the idea. And I, I really appreciated that. And so I wanted to share that. I also wanted to share some um, 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 musical uh, artists that have been, um, just have been blessing me in the past few weeks. Uh, the first I'll mention is uh, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors and his wife, uh, Ellie Holcomb. Uh, Ellie Holcomb seem, sings more praise music, and uh, her husband Drew and his group sing uh, kind of like pop country sort of stuff. And uh, I've really appreciated it. I've really uh, in, just found it to be encouraging. And so I just want to pass that on to you. And uh, I think it's maybe a good recommendation because Monica told me it was. So there you go. If you like the music Monica likes, you might like this. And then the other thing is just going back, I stumbled across some old albums um, by Rich Mullins that I have. You may remember him as the guy who wrote the song uh, that we know as Step by Step. It's actually called Sometimes by Step. That's the name he gave it. But I've just found uh, that to be really encouraging. So I wanted to pass that on. And then, uh, you know, kind of getting into my uh, uh, Lent theme more, but still passing on encouraging things. I recently watched uh, a DVD, which is, was the cheapest way I could find, find to watch this movie, uh, a movie called A Hidden Life. Uh, it's, a, it's a Terrence Malick movie, if you're into movie directors, 
which means it's kind of arty and long. <laughs> it's a true story of a, a World War II conscientious objector. Um, his name is uh, Franz uh, Jaeger or something or other. I should have that. Oh, Franz Jaegerstatter. He is a guy who began his life kind of wasting it. And then he, um, he met his wife, who was very uh, faithful as a follower of Christ. And he became uh, really a convinced follower of Jesus, read his Bible really um, a lot. And during World War II, he, he was a conscientious objector. Now, he wasn't a conscientious objector here, where it was hard enough to be a conscientious objector in those days. He was a conscientious objector in Austria. Uh, not, he refused to swear an oath to Adolf Hitler. And that's what this movie's about. Now, it's called The Hidden Life, and that's based on the, the, the passage that Paul wrote in the letter to the church in Colossae, Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 3. He says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then the next verse, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And that's what the movie uh, is the movie title is based on and the, the theme of the movie. Uh, Terrence Malick is a, is a, a Christian, he, he, uh, and he makes really beautiful films. Um, and I found this one uh, a little tedious to watch, but really beautiful. And uh, it's, it's been kind of haunting me since I watched it. Uh, as Susie mentioned to me after we watched it together, he could have told that story in 20 minutes. <laughs> And he could have, but that wasn't his purpose. His purpose is, is very intentional. He, he, he conveys in every scene um, and every, in every moment of the movie that following Jesus is in the mundane things of life. It's, it's, it's perseverance. It's perseverance in the face of opposition to living that way. And he, he very successfully conveys that in a very beautiful and moving way. So it kind of it haunts me, and it kind of encourages me, the, the, the story of his life. Um, you can read about him. I mean, he's a real guy. Um, and the record of what happened to him is through letters that he and his wife exchanged while he was in prison for being a conscientious objector. And uh, so I, I would recommend that movie. And, and what it made me think of in this season of Lent, Lent is a time when people give things up. They give things up because they want to focus on Christ. That's the idea. And the, and the idea is, is, let's say, if you give up some kind of food or something you really uh, want, that when you think about that and you, you have desire to have it, that you use that as an occasion to turn your thoughts Towards, towards God, towards, towards Jesus and, and prayer. Um, but it makes, it, I'll, I'll be honest, the season of Lent makes me nervous every year. Nervous is probably not the right word. Um, Susie and I were talking about it the other day, and, 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 and the thing that we find is we have so many people we know for whom seasons like Lent, it, it's kind of like a time when they do stuff that's religious, but they're not really following Jesus in any of the rest of their life. So they do the ashes, you know, and they don't eat meat on Fridays, and they, you know, or they give something up because it's a way of kind of saying, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. But they're really not following Christ, and that's the danger of it. The danger of, of, of things like outward practices that we do is we can do them for show. We can do them to make ourselves feel good about who we are when we're really not following Christ in most of our life. Um, I mean, what, what, is, what is religion? What is religious as a concept, right? Why is that separate from the idea of life? See, that's, that's the Quaker ideal. Our concept is that we are created to, to be the embodiment of, 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 of the image of God, right? Carrying, 
carrying his spirit around and, and living life motivated by Christ within us and our relationship to him. And, and when you say something is religious, it's like, it's like a separate thing in your life. It's not the core of your life. It's, it's, it's a compartment of it. And that's the, that's the danger of, of, of things like Lent or other, other things that can be ritualized and separated out from the rest of life. And it's why uh, the emphasis among friends has been that all of life should be at Lent, right? All of life should be focused on Christ. And I realize that there's, there are times, special times, special practices that can draw us close to Christ. And we can, we can include them in our life in a way that is very beneficial. I mean, we show up at church on Sunday morning, right? at least in other times of the year. <laughs> now we show up on Zoom. But, you know, why, what's special about Sunday morning? Well, nothing except that's when we've agreed to be together and worship together and to encourage one another. And that's a good thing. And, and, and we all understand that just showing up for the worship service is not what being a Christian is about. Uh, and so on. You can, you can carry that, that out. Well, this is a time of season when it's, it's easy to see people who are not really following Jesus in their life in general, doing special things in order to kind of plant a flag and say, see, I'm a Christian. And, that, and that's, that's the thing that makes me nervous about it, that makes me um, want to stand up and say, no, 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 it's, all, it's about all of life. It's about all of life. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do things for Lent, that you shouldn't do something that, that in your life draws you close to Christ. That's all good. I'm just saying there's a danger. And the danger was highlighted in this movie, uh, A Hidden Life. Because in the village that this guy lived in, they're very religious. They, got a, they have a church. The whole village goes, show, goes to church many times. And they all swore an oath of, oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler and set aside the truth about what he was doing and who he was. Um, and this farmer, his name is Franz Jägerstatter, as I, I stumbled over earlier, um, he literally gives up his life and everything he loves except Jesus because he's so committed to following Christ. Now, one of the scenes in the movie that just really struck me, it was just riveting. He goes to church and he tries to ask the priest, um, you know, what he should be doing. And the priest gives him some lame stuff about, you know, being obedient to the authorities that God has instituted, blah, 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 the kind of stuff that you hear as an excuse for evil. And he's not really very satisfied with that. He's like, but, but, but hasn't God given us free will? And aren't we responsible for what we do with it? And, and, and how can we do things that someone is telling us to do that we know are wrong? And, you know, there's this discussion they have. But that's not what, what was riveting. He leaves the priest's office and he goes out and there's a painter who's painting the, the church building, the sanctuary. And the, in, in his village, the church is painted with scenes I mean, it's not just, you know, painting in a color. It's, it's, the painter is an artist who's painting pictures of things on the ceiling and the walls. And, and the, the scene cuts to him helping the painter, handing him, uh, you know, things he needs to do his work because he's a generally helpful guy around his church. And, and the painter goes into a, a, a monologue to him, telling him about his painting. And here's what the painter says. He says, I paint tombs of the prophets. I help people look up from those pews and dream. They look up and they imagine that if they had lived back in Christ's time, they wouldn't have done what the others did. They wouldn't have murdered those whom they now adore. I paint all this suffering and I don't suffer myself. I make a living off it. What we do is just create sympathy. We create, we create admirers. We don't create followers. 
Christ's life is a demand. You don't want to be reminded of it. So we don't have to see what happens to the truth. Darker time is coming and men will be more clever. They won't fight the truth. No, they'll just ignore it. I paint their comfortable Christ with a halo over his head. How can I show what I haven't lived? Someday, I might have the courage to venture. Not yet. Someday. Someday, I'll, I'll paint the true Christ. And it's just a very powerful moment in the movie. And, and so my, my desire in, in talking about all of this is that our lives, our lives, you know, my life, your life, uh, our lives together would paint a picture that's an accurate picture of who Christ is and that people could see it. Um, it's not an easy world we live in. And it's easy to go along with it and just live the life. And the hidden life with Christ really is hidden. Now, it's interesting to me, there's, there's kind of double meaning to that word hidden, right? The, the hidden in Corinthian or Colossians 3 is that in the world's eyes, our life in Christ is, is hidden, but yet people can see it, they just don't get it. So it's hidden in that sense. And then it becomes known as Christ becomes known. And that's what's happening in this movie. David said it like this, Psalm 10. I'm going to read all of Psalm 10. Okay. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourselves, yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in, this, in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord, David says. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. There David is, is working through in his own words how sometimes in this world it seems like wicked people prosper and that those who are innocent are victimized. And, and, and he, he, he goes on, right? He says, the victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. That's the hopeful note that he ends on. But there's a time. There are times when mere earthly mortals can strike terror, can cause trouble. And where is our life hidden? Is our life safe and secure with Christ? Whether people can see it all the time, when they can see it, is that what they see? Maybe they're blinded. Um, but is that what the reality of us is? Then the other thing that, I, that this psalm brings to mind is it says, 
Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And that reminded me of something else I wanted to mention to you is that, that I found a blessing. It's a book called Father Elijah by Michael D. O'Brien. Uh, it's, a, it's a Catholic uh, book, uh, but very Christian. And it's about the end times. And don't let that scare you away from it. There's a scene, in, or there's this two chapters seen in this book set um, after World War II, but where Father Elijah is talking to a man who did awful things during World War II. And they have this discussion, and the, the man who's very uh, angry and defending his evil you know, talks about there being no God. Where was God when I was doing these horrible things that he did? And Father Elijah says to him that, that, that Jesus was right there with those people that he was doing that to. And I, 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 it's a very, very powerful couple of chapters in this book. Um, some of the most powerful writing I've, I've read anywhere. Um, and I thought, well, is that supported by biblical testimony, right? Is that what the Bible says about suffering? And I think it, I think it is. Um, and, and, and so I, I thought about the, the whole idea of, of suffering, and the thing that people point out is Jesus suffering on the cross, and how that pays for sin, that, that makes things right. Somehow that's God's way of saying, I've got this. Whatever the cost of sin is, I'm paying it. And the thought occurred to me, and I, I really haven't, have not fleshed this out in my own thinking and, and pursued it very much. But the thought crossed my mind, what if Jesus' suffering on the cross isn't just a one-time, one limited in space and time event so much as when the suffering of God because of our sin became incarnate and visible to us. That is, if God loves us, and that's clearly a biblical idea, that when innocent human beings suffer, and probably even when those who aren't so innocent suffer, that, that costs God. He, he doesn't enjoy that. He suffers. And not only does he suffer, he takes it into account. And it's, it's his responsibility to make things right. And so what if Jesus' suffering on the cross is just God's way of communicating to us, hey, this is what's going on all the time. Jesus is always suffering for our sin, but you saw it there. You saw it. You saw he was innocent. He joined you in the suffering. The world did its worst to him. Dallas Willard, uh, in his book, Renovation of the Heart, defines love as the genuine inner readiness and longing to secure the good of others. And yeah, that's what Jesus does. He genuinely is ready to do what is necessary to secure our good at his own expense. And, and he not only from a distance looks and is willing for that, he's there in, in the middle of it. One of the things I observed in, in the, the movie I was talking about, A Hidden Life, first of all, there's Franz Jägerstatter himself who experiences the presence of God with him that he tells his wife about in his letters. But also, a large part of the movie is her struggle. They're farmers, and she and her sister and the children try to keep the farm going and keep life working while he's gone and in prison. And they have to endure the, you know, the insults and the scorn of other people in the village who claim to follow Jesus, but who are acting like they're doing something wrong. 
and she continues to support him. Even while she questions, is it worth it? She supports him. And she struggles to make things work. And she's there with him. You know, if this is what you have to do, right, she's, she's with him. Uh, while he takes a course of action that's painful and it costs them a lot, costs them him, but it honors Christ. So all of that, uh, you know, reminds me uh, of the way that we handle the use of power and authority in the church, right? Because that's where people often get hurt. And where Jesus says, don't lord it over other people like the nations, those who are following other gods do, right? Don't be like that. And he demonstrates how he came to serve. That's his love in action, right? And so in, in, you may have some idea of the kinds of things that, <laughs> that have caused me to think about these thoughts. I'm not gonna get into that right now. But the, the problem we see in, in church governments is people use coercive power because God ordained them. God called them to a role, and so they decide this is how it's going to be, and, and they unilaterally make decisions, or groups of people do that. And, and the things that we've done among friends, and, and many other churches too, it's not unique to us, but one of the things that's been very important to us as friends is how we agree on how leaders are going to use power in advance. And they work within those limitations. And even within those limitations, they're, they're supposed to be building unity. They're supposed to be collaboration. They're supposed to be um, including people impacted by decisions in the decision making and, there's, and transparency and accountability. Right? It's not like the guy at the top can do whatever he wants and no one can call him to account. We, we, we are not a hierarchical uh, form of government in that way, although we do call people to be leaders. They're accountable. And then there has to be an availability of some kind of recourse. Right? Even in Scripture, when David was uh, in authority and he did bad things, Nathan called him to account. Now, who could have enforced that being called to account? I don't know. But so, so I've been thinking through how do we demonstrate this love of Christ in, in the way that we do handle power and authority in the church. And so I, I'll just make a list. I haven't really pr thought this out fully either. We agree on the limitations of that power, right? And, 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 and this fits into the movie too, right? They're coercing this guy to take an oath of, of loyalty to a human leader and, and forcing him to fight in the army. And, and he's not agreeing to that. Well, what are the agreed limitations in our, in our church government? How are we building unity in making decisions? How are they transparent? How are they collaborative? How do they include the people that are impacted by the decisions? So what kind of accountability is there? Uh, we hold our, our, our leaders that we call accountable to the whole body. And then we work together to, find the, to, to follow Christ, who's the one who's leading us. And what recourse is there? We are with people in the decisions, if we're leaders in the church, in the way Jesus does it, as opposed to lording it over them. So I, I, I want to I finish up by taking that passage of, of Corinthians, I keep saying Corinthians, of Colossians 3, uh, and I want to read the whole chapter, the one about our life being hidden in Christ, because Paul fleshes out what that looks like. If we're going to live in the way that follows Christ, what does that look like? He says it like this, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you, will, you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile, no other, and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's pretty good for only one chapter of, <laughs> of a letter. Uh, I, I want to read that what that painter said again in the church. You're t keeping in mind what Paul just said, right? The painter says it like this. He says, I paint tombs of the prophets. I help people look up from these, those pews and dream. They look up and they imagine that if they'd lived back in Christ's time, they wouldn't have done what the others did. They wouldn't have murdered those whom they now adore. I paint all this suffering, and I don't suffer myself. I make a living off it. What we do is just create sympathy. We create, we create admirers. We don't create followers. Christ's life is a demand. You don't want to be reminded of it. <laughs> so we don't have to see what happens to the truth. A darker time is coming, and men will be more clever. They won't fight the truth. No, just ignore it. I paint their comfortable Christ with a halo over his head. How can I show what I haven't lived? Someday I might have the courage to venture. Not yet. Someday I'll, I'll paint the true Christ. I, I see the shape of Christ in our lives together, at least as I've experienced it. And uh, I pray that uh, my life, your life, and our lives together would paint a true picture of Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you've called us to a great privilege to be with you, to live a life that is hidden in you at some level in this world that we are in today, but that will be made known as Jesus is glorified. And we pray that it would be made known now in a way that attracts people to Christ. Not to be admirers of Christ, but to lay down their lives and be followers of Christ. Lord, we pray that for ourselves, that we would be followers of Christ and that it would be visible such as people have eyes to see, such as their senses are open to know the truth. We pray that that would be so and that people would turn to Christ and become followers also. Thank you for times of thinking through these things, a time when we can um, be together as your people and practice things that can help us in making our lives truly be a unified whole under Christ, and that this season is one of those times if we take it that way, and I pray that we would. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.